we can start. Good afternoon and welcome to you all to today's online debate organized by the Florence School of Banking and Finance on the topic Bank Board Member and Policymaker, a conversation. My name is Elena Carletti. I'm a professor of finance at Bocconi University. I'm the founding director of the Florence School of Banking and Finance, and I am a non-executive director at Unicredit, where I now chair the risk committee. I am delighted to chair the debate today and would, would very much like to start by welcoming our two speakers, Andrea Ria, the chair of the supervisory board of the European Central Bank, and Carlos Torres Villa, the chairman of BBVA, and also the chair of the European Banking Group within the European Financial Services Roundtable. Although I understand that today he will be sharing his personal views rather than representing the EBG position. So thank you to both of you for joining us today. We are really grateful for your time. We know the demand that you have in your time and really look forward to your contribution. So before we start with the seminar, allow me just a few words. First of all, the seminar today is a, a part of a new initiative of the Florence School of Banking and Finance called Bank Board Academy for Non-Executive Directors. The initiative aims at stimulating and enhancing the interaction of independent board members with the supervisors and regulators and among themselves with the overall goal of helping the non-executive directors play their role in bank's board in the most valuable way. The initiative is built around the two pillars. We have a seminar series, Challenges for Bank Board Members is the title. We started the last December, and we also want to thank the SSM for the support and the presence in our series. I think Andrea today is the third speaker of the executive board of the SSM with us today. And then together with the seminar series, we have training activities. And the first one is going to start, the first activity is going to start in early June and we span over June and July. So today is the last seminar before the training session start and is a sort of a recap of the topics that we have occurred so far in the seminar series since last December. So what are the topics we would like to cover? We are going to have many, but essentially we can divide them in three broad categories. First of all, the evolution of bank internal governance, a topic that in particular Andrea will be covering in his initial remark. And then how such evolution, such evolution allows bank boards to be better prepared to the many challenges that the bank are experiencing right now, starting with the COVID crisis, but not only, the acceleration of trends like digitalization, new entrants, customer behavior that is changing rapidly, or expertise and diversity of boards. And finally, once we will cover these two topics, we also move next to a little bit more forward looking, thinking of how banks can sustain the new European recovery. What is the role of bank boards in this context? But what also is the role that a supervisor can play in sustaining the role that banks can play in the implementation of the next generation EU? So these are three main categories that I really like that, I mean, I wish that we can cover during the talk today. So we will start with some initial remarks from each speaker, first Andres and then Carlos for about eight, 10 minutes, and then we will proceed with the Q&A. And for that, we have collected already some questions during the registration phase, but as usual, I can invite the audience and in particular the NEDs that are attending the seminar today to pose questions in the Q&A box, not in the chat box, please, that you can find in the bottom bar in your screen. So with that, let me stop here without further ado and let me thank again both Carlos and Andreas to be with us and let me give the microphone to Andrea for his initial remark that I understand will focus on what has been the evolution of internal governance and what are still the open issues that you see for that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Elena. Uh, thanks for inviting me. It's a great pleasure to be here today, also because, as you say, you have been quite supportive of this initiative, uh, which uh, of, uh, I mean, the Bank Board Academy, we are, we are uh, keen to, you know, uh, support and initiatives that can strengthen the governance and uh, of, of European banks. 
Uh, and there are many challenges, as you said, COVID-19 is one, but I'm sure there will be more uh, also when COVID hopefully soon will be gone to be dealt with by, by banks boards. Um, to, to steer a bit the conversation, I will talk about, as you mentioned, about how banks' internal governance has developed in recent years. And, uh, and I will try to highlight uh, some areas where we still think that improvements are needed and uh, discuss the supervisory tools that we are trying to uh, deploy to encourage banks uh, to further improve uh, the effectiveness of their boards. Uh, of course, sound governance and strong internal controls are crucial for fostering uh, responsible decision making at banks and mitigating the, the risk that they face during normal times and also uh, even more so in times of crisis. And uh, as part of our uh, ongoing supervision, we encourage banks to have clearly established lines of responsibility, adequate risk management, effective controls, and checks and balances at every level of the organization, starting, of course, with the board, where non-executive director plays a key, a key role. Uh, as supervisors, what we have served uh, in, the, in, in the last few years is that bank boards indeed have improved. Uh, from our, of course, uh, uh, perspective. They've became, they become uh, more aware of uh, their role, uh, of the impact that, uh, that they have on, uh, on banks' activities and culture. Um, I like to believe that also the enhanced clarity that the ECB has given on the supervisory expectations and how we expect the boards to behave has been helpful to focus the attention and to steer in some extent, to some extent also this uh, uh, journey to improve and to raise the bar on, on governance. Uh, let me give you uh, some example. Uh, the knowledge and experience of non-executive board members is becoming more robust. This is a point that we have raised quite a lot in the recent past, and we see that the percentage of board members with more than five years of experience in banking, finance, and economics has increased over the last few years and is now higher than 80%. Uh, board expertise is also expanding and becoming more diversified across uh, new risk areas. And this is particularly relevant uh, uh, in, in some areas. So seeing, for instance, that uh, uh, the number of non-executive board members with solid experience on IT uh, almost doubled during the last year, from 13% in 2017 to 24% in 2020. And this also reflects the bank's recent digitalization efforts. But for instance, we made an interesting uh, analysis uh, last year in which uh, uh, we tried to see whether there was any correlation between the presence of uh, IT expertise in the board and the uh, number and relevance of cyber attacks. And, uh, and indeed there was, I mean, the, the banks that were, uh, that had some IT expertise in the board were also the banks that were less uh, prone to uh, being, let's say, uh, on the receiving side of uh, cyber attacks. Um, European banks are also uh, making room on their boards for more formally independent members. Uh, the proportion in relation to the non-executive members increased from around 50% in 2017 to almost 60% uh, at the end of 2020. Uh, experience and independent non-executive directors are key to foster a critical debate um, uh, about strategic decisions and to challenge uh, executive directors. And I would say that uh, this is particularly important at this juncture. I mean, uh, it is improving recently, let's say, but uh, banks' uh, valuations, European banks' valuations have been in a very depressed uh, area uh, uh, until very recently, it's still uh, on average well below uh, uh, price to books are well below one. And this reflected also the perception, our perception, bankers' perception, and investors' perception that uh, uh, there was an issue of sustainability of business models. So having, uh, having a strong board with uh, independent non-executive directors challenging uh, the, the executives is key in my view to steer the transformation of business models towards more sustainable uh, paths. Uh, uh, focusing on, uh, on the core areas that are generating revenues, uh, uh, reinforcing the need to become more cost efficient, which has been also big, a big issue across many banks uh, in, the, in the banking union, 
and uh, and also maybe identifying areas to exit because they're being non profitable for a for a long while. Um, of course, non executive could also play an important role in uh, in driving you know the the uh, the attention of executives towards the need to invest in digitalization, properly manage climate related risks, and considering also consolidation as a possible option. As we know, there is uh, quite some excess capacity in the European banking sector, so having uh, attention also to these options is important, again, to strengthen the sustainability of business models. And again, as, I, as we, we mentioned, also you mentioned, Elena, having uh, effective boards is important at all times. It is particularly important at times of crisis, and banks seem to be aware of that. And since the start of the COVID-19 crisis, most banks have enhanced their interaction between executive and non-executive board members, either by using existing committees or by establishing also new crisis ones to deal with the most pressing challenges raised by the pandemic. And in general, good governance has paid off well. Uh, banks with strong governance have been quicker to reprioritize projects and make good use of digital opportunities to adjust their strategy as, as required. Unfortunately, of course, and despite the progress that I just mentioned, uh, the oversight capacity of both in many banks is still not uh, strong enough. Uh, in particular, the, the area of focus for us is the capacity, the, the ability of non executive board members to uh, really challenge uh, uh, directors, not only in relation to Corona related topics such as credit risk management and capital planning, but also on longer term topics that will ultimately determine the sustainability of banks business models, such as climate risk, digitalization and, and information technology and cyber risk. Um, although the proportion of formal independent board members has increased on average, it remains still too low in some banks to ensure sufficient oversight. And this might hamper the quality of the debate regarding executive decisions uh, during the pandemic and may damage also the um, effectiveness of future decisions. Another area where progress can still be made is diversity in the composition of bank boards. Around a fifth of euro era banks have still not implemented either a diversity policy or diversity target, while those that have still have a long way to go in terms of implementing this, uh, this policy. Uh, furthermore, women still make up uh, less than a third of European bank non-executive directors and only a quarter of bank executive directors for the significant institutions supervised directly by the ECB. Um, with all the widely documented benefits of diverse boards um, and, and that diversity brings to any organization, uh, this is of course a matter of concern and one that will encourage uh, progress uh, in, the, in, the coming, in the coming months and years. Uh, and it, on our side, our joint supervisory teams will continue to assess the effectiveness of bank boards, both in terms of their composition and functioning uh, as part of the uh, supervisory review and evaluation process. Now, in close, the third block of what I want to say today, it, uh, it concerns our own uh, fit and proper uh, processes. Um, uh, to support banks uh, to, uh, in addressing the shortcomings that remain and take all the challenges ahead, uh, uh, the ECB is upgrading its guide on fit and proper assessments. Uh, and we try to further clarify our expectations, what we expect bank board members to, uh, uh, to, uh, to have, what we expect in terms of diversity, so that we can uh, you know, try to uh, to uh, provide clearer guidance uh, to banks in their internal recruitment and assessment process. Uh, the guide uh, will be, uh, re the revised guide will be submitted for uh, consultation soon. It has been approved by the board. We are now fine tuning the last uh, details and uh, um, tries to clarify exactly how we uh, run this uh, uh, delicate process. And uh, of course, uh, you know, I will come to that in a second, that uh, uh, we are in the rather unfortunate position to have to apply very different national regulatory frameworks, no, on fit and proper. It's an area where we have uh, the directive, not the regulation, and, uh, and where the impl national implementation is very, very different. 
but we are aiming to uh, you know, increase in any case the consistency and level playing field of our analysis and of the outcomes of our, of our fit and proper assessments, uh, uh, which is crucial, I think, to have you know, really a, a common approach for European banking supervision. Um, we will devote more, uh, more attention to assess the diversity within boards and the ability to deal with emerging risks. Regarding gender diversity, we are trying to make sure that the existing national frameworks and internal rules for the enforcement of gender quotas are tackled as part of the fit and proper assessment and ongoing supervision. And regarding climate risk, and in line with the guide that we published on climate risk in November of last year, we will encourage also banks to consider uh, climate-specific skills and expertise when recruiting members for their boards. Uh, as I mentioned before, again, uh, fit and proper supervision is one of the most fragmented topics in banking supervision. Uh, we have very different uh, national frameworks in terms of both uh, uh, the, the, the way of assessing ex ante versus ex post, uh, the timelines which are given for the assessment when there is a timeline, sometimes there is even no timeline in national legislation. So we are always trying to uh, uh, struggle no, with the, the implementation of very different, uh, very different rules. And that's why, let's say, uh, we do really hope that uh, with the next cycle of uh, legislative uh, initiative, which we expect uh, to come uh, after the summer for the implementation of the Basel III final uh, package, we hope that this will be a moment to uh, further harmonize uh, uh, the, the fit and proper assessment across uh, all the banking union. Um, and this, as I mentioned, uh, the timing, you know, the, the ex ante or ex post assessment is, is an important, is an important uh, element. Um, uh, also the scope in terms of the coverage uh, to expand it to the head of the internal control functions would also be an important uh, element. And uh, we would also like to see a, a reinforcement of the bank's responsibility for implementing adequate internal suitability policies and processes at group level for the group as a whole. So let me conclude here. Uh, I, I think that uh, these, I hope that this uh, revised approach uh, to fit and proper supervision and also our ongoing, uh, let's say, supervisory assessment of governance within the, the threat process uh, and uh, uh, will provide sort of strengthened uh, environment for uh, diverse, experienced and effective uh, non-executive board members that can really uh, uh, contribute to promote a culture of a constructive challenge within uh, within banks board. Um, this is uh, this is very important uh, to tackle the difficult challenges which are ahead of us in the fallout of the uh, COVID nineteen pandemic in uh, in banks balance sheets and uh, business lines, but in the longer term also to tackle the challenges uh, which have to do with uh, uh, climate and environmental risks. Uh, um, digitalization, uh, cyber risk, and so on. And of course, uh, uh, the dialogue between uh, uh, bank uh, non-executive director and supervisors is also key to ensuring a mutual understanding, which is why I also welcome the opportunity today. Thank you. Thank you, Elena. Thank you to you all. Yeah, thank you, Andrea, for this interesting uh, initial remarks. I would have already lots of questions, but I will try to refrain myself. Just one maybe uh, follow up to what you said before we go to Carlos, because he will also be touching upon some of the issues that you have touched. But one of the questions that were submitted um, in the registration by, by one of the attendees concerned the independence of NEDS, on which you spent quite a, some focus on, on your remarks. And in particular, what do you see are the key challenges to, to evaluate the independence of an executive director? Because, I mean, one thing is on paper, and one thing is then effectively during the, the life of the mandate. So what, how do you think we can evaluate the independence of, uh, of, um, of an ed? For you, Andrea, sorry. Yeah, yeah, no, thanks. Well, uh, independence is indeed a, a, a difficult area to, uh, to assess, no? because uh, uh, it's not something that can be you know, translated into a sort of uh, 
quantitative indicator that you that you put on a on a chart and you and you measure. I mean, the, the key dimension is generally um, independence of mind, no? As it is defined in the in the in the also in the guidelines and the joint guidelines by the EBA and ESMA. I mean, EBA and ESMA have provided a number of. Uh, uh, criteria, but of course, uh, let's say eventually uh, there is a lot of room for uh, for a judgment here. So I think that indeed uh, the most important uh, uh, step for us is uh, to um, try to uh, push the, uh, the 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 candidates, for instance, for vote position. First of all, to give full disclosure of all the potential conflicts of interest and. Uh, and of the possible mitigating factors that, uh, that would be in place. And then uh, the most important step for us is the interview that we run with the, uh, with the board, with the candidates for the, for the positions to really uh, check and challenge uh, this, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this type of uh, self-assessment that uh, uh, candidates themselves are, are making. So that's, uh, that's the key focus for us uh, in, in terms of assessing the independence, but of course, you know, it's uh, as usual, the proof of the cake is in the eating. So <laughs> sometimes it's very difficult to have a, an effective, uh, an effective uh, scrutiny example, but we, we do the best we can with the tools we have. Okay, let's now move to Carlos. And I think the question that we, we posed to you for uh, uh, the initial remark was uh, very much on how this evolution of internal governance that Andrea touched upon has helped the banks or will help the banks going forward or also now in tackling the challenges that the banks are experiencing. Please. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, uh, everyone. And, and thank you for joining. Uh, and thank you, Elena, for, for inviting me to participate in the, in the seminar. Thank you also for not posing the uh, question on how to assess independence to me. Uh, I was uh, fearing uh, for a minute, but uh, I'm glad that Andrea took it. Uh, thank you also to, uh, to, to you, Andrea. It's a pleasure to, uh, to be joined by you in the seminar. Um, to your question, I would first say that uh, we should be careful with generalizations. Typically are not good characterizations of reality necessarily. Um, and uh, I would start by pointing out that, that not all banks are equally prepared. And not all banks were equally prepared back in, in 2008. Um, although it's true, and, and I think Andrea did a great job of, of going through things we've changed. Uh, we learned a lot. We made extensive changes. Uh, and uh, and uh, as you said, uh, Andrea, regulators and supervisors clearly raised the bar. And as a result, most banks today are better prepared in many respects. We have more focus on the customer. We have leaner structures, less, less over capacity. For sure, we have strengthened capital levels. Um, and no doubt, we have stronger internal governance. And this stronger internal governance leads to better decision making, higher quality decision making at the board, but also at the executive levels. Um, and it leads to better management and, and better mitigation uh, of risks. Just before I tackle the future, I would highlight uh, some of the elements of governance that have improved in my experience uh, that have to do with clarifying how the organization functions and, and how to uh, mitigate the concentration of power uh, through uh, checks and balances, ro robust checks and balances. So internal regulations and explicit policies, clear allocation of duties and responsibilities across the organization, effective controls, and, and most importantly, I would highlight the culture uh, and some tangible elements that enable proper decision-making, which is really what governance is all about and promote the adequate challenge uh, from the board. Um, and things like improved procedures, improved documentation, committee uh, interaction, uh, and board composition. Andrea was talking about skills, diversity, how important that is. Um, and I think in all of those counts, banks in general have made uh, great strides. And the response to COVID has been a good one, I believe, and it's quite indicative how uh, banks have been better prepared and, and how, how that better response has enabled us to be part of the solution. We, we had a, a major, um, major crisis, the health and then economic, and we responded quickly to this very challenging situation. We kept providing an essential service. We kept supporting families, businesses, SMEs. We gave liquidity, uh, alleviated the burden with, with uh, some of the federal programs, um, 
also uh, thanks to uh, government support programs. Um, so we were able to do that because of financial strength. Also having a proper internal governance, I believe proved critical to manage the crisis successfully. Certainly it was the BVDA. We uh, very quickly set up in record time, a network of war rooms to deal with all of the issues that had to do with the crisis across all of the, all of the countries where we operate uh, in a very coordinated way uh, to manage health issues, operational issues. And these war rooms and the network of war rooms kept a constant dialogue, uh, first with the, with the JST. And, and of course, there was uh, a lot of uh, scrutiny and focus on, on how we were responding but also with the board, frequent reports to the board of directors as needed. We had adopted uh, and adapted uh, the, the um, we adapted how the uh, board, the board met and, and the committees as well in a very rapid fashion, increasing the frequency of the meetings and with reinforced reporting covering the most relevant topics. So the state of the crisis from a health perspective, continuity plans, which became uh, very relevant technology and operational continuity plans, review of the macro and its implications given the major shifts and the volatility in GDP uh, that we were witnessing, uh, unprecedented. The, 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 the um, big activity in regulatory uh, development, so rapidly shifting environment, new rules everywhere, government support programs, the federal programs, all of that. And then, of course, the sum, to sum it all, the monitoring of the impact on the business. Uh, at first, it was focused on liquidity, uh, very quickly, uh, credit quality, as well as uh, the PNL and, and volumes. And here, the board committees, in our particular case, particularly the risk committee and the audit committee, which are made up mostly of independents, uh, played a key role in, in the process. I would also highlight the role in our particular case of the Technology and Cyber Security Committee of the board, which was created in 2016 to guide our, uh, our technology strategy and to monitor the cyber risk. Uh, it's five directors, uh, one executive and four independent. All five have extensive professional background in technology uh, and their knowledge and their expertise in, in, in that field have proven to be essential in general, in our road to digitization, um, and, uh, as Andrea pointed out, this is critical, uh, but also specifically in particular to support the board during COVID on matters which were key for continuity uh, with this massive remote working and increased cyber risk uh, and also increased fraud, uh, fraud risk. So for all of that, 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 that committee proved essential. So that's the past, I'm sorry, maybe I took too long, but looking ahead, which was your question. After this very demanding year, and, and despite the, the, the high uncertainty we still have, we look at, to the future with, with optimism. We see GDP is going to rebound in the second half very strongly. Vaccination is reaching high percentages, lockdowns die away, massive stimulus program kick in. Uh, and in that sense, uh, we're optimists. Of course, there's still uh, short-term risks and challenges. We have great competitive pressure uh, driven by the high liquidity. We have new entrants also, fintechs, big techs, uh, in this new, uh, completely digitized world. And, and COVID has had an impact, has really accelerated that trend. We have the low rates, which are here for long. We have the credit quality uh, that we need to look at uh, very carefully, NPLs and provisioning needs. Uh, so all those support programs are going to be expiring. We're exiting the so-called hibernation. Uh, so things are looking good because the economy will rebound. We have a lot of provisions uh, that we made last year. The base case, I believe, is a good one, but this is clearly a challenge that requires uh, close oversight. Um, so great challenges, as I mentioned, and robust internal governance with adequate information system, adequate decision-making processes were critical and will continue to be critical going forward uh, in the recovery phase. And, and they will continue to be even more critical to address the longer term challenges, uh, inequality, climate change, climate change in particular, and maybe we'll talk more about that later, is the greatest economic disruption in the history of mankind, in my view. This is a huge risk, a huge uh, challenge. It can also be a huge opportunity to deploy capital profitably to support our clients in the transition. Um, 
Also, we have short-term opportunities, speaking of opportunity, uh, to support the recovery and maximize the impact of the European funds to help set the ground for a more sustainable, more inclusive growth. Uh, also, this might help us regain the profitability that has been lost over the last decade. So again, great challenges, but they also bring great opportunities. And the most important one, the most important challenge, the most important opportunity in my mind has to do with technological disruption in a wide sense. Uh, we are living in, a, in an age of opportunity, um, an age of, of massive change, of, of, of disruption. And, and, and we call it the age of opportunity at BBVA because our purpose at BBVA is in fact to bring the age of opportunity to everyone. So what do we mean by this? What's going on? Well, we see new technologies popping up everywhere. AI, robotics, 3D printing, sequencing of the, uh, of the, of the genome uh, and editing the genome, energy storage, blockchain, decentralized protocols, quantum computing, you name it. And all of these technologies, all of this disruption will radically transform transversely our economies. They will transform the way things are built, the way things are manufactured, delivered, the way things combine with each other, the way things are financed. Things and services, services will explode. Uh, many tasks will be taken up by robots at very low prices. So there'll be a lot of change happening. This change will happen and is happening at an accelerated pace because in all of these technology platforms, that change is exponential, an exponential trend. And it will be affecting virtually every industry uh, because the technologies are of transversal nature. So there will be massive change in, in medicine and how medical assistance is provided. It'll be, that's very clear, but, but in food and energy, massive change in energy because of the decarbonization need, massive change in finance for sure. We can talk about decentralized protocols and how that can impact in manufacturing, in transport, in everything, you name it. Uh, and there will be successful newcomers and there will be dead incumbents. And we are banks, we should be wanting to side with the winning clients. Um, so, sorry I may have, or it may seem I may have gone off topic, but I have not, because this is my main point, that effective boards not only need to oversee traditional management and risk vectors, they need to be adaptive, they need to be innovative, they need to be forward-looking to ensure that the institution remains on the right side of change. You stand still and your bank will likely be wrong-footed in, what, in a decade? invested in, in stranded assets, invested in, in dwindling business models, invested in, in the incumbents of, of the past, of yesteryear. So from a board perspective, there's clear implications here. So the board needs to understand and be cognizant of, of the trends, of the technologies and their impact. So the board needs to be exposed so they can effectively guide, they can effectively oversee. The boards must also allow for innovation, experimentation, and this is hard. This is something that supervisors and bank boards uh, shy away from, from that because of the risk avoidance. Uh, uh, you know, we rather go through the trodden path, but that might be uh, a, bad, a bad recommendation at the, the times of such massive change. And then uh, I would highlight also the board composition that Andrea was talking about, very important in my mind, that the board composition reflects this changing board. So, we have already made big change at BBVA. Just to give you a statistic, uh, out of 15 directors, seven came in in the last three years as part of the normal renewal. But we took advantage of that to bring new skills uh, and more diversity. Uh, on gender, we are at 33% right now, um, you know, women versus the total. Uh, next year, we'll be at 40. Uh, and no doubt, there'll be still room to continue to enhance uh, board diversity. We also incorporated different nationalities, different backgrounds, not only different skills, but there's still much more work to be done uh, in general in all banks, I believe, uh, to incorporate the skills that are needed for the bank's uh, strategy. Anyway, I, I could uh, delve deeper, but maybe I'm, I'm taking too long. I do believe that in this process of increasing diversity uh, in general and bringing in the proper skills, the new ECB uh, fit and proper guide that Andrea mentioned is, is very timely and, and could, could help harmonize the things that are different, which are many, uh, and that would provide also certainty and streamline the process for everyone that will save uh, many of the hurdles that exist today. 
Um, so it's, 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 I believe, a great opportunity. Um, uh, so th th those would be my remarks. In conclusion and summing up, I would say that banks and the boards have many challenges ahead, but we have come a long way. And there are also many opportunities. We have proved our strength. We have proved our adequate gover governance in, in the face of this very extraordinary circumstance, uh, which has been the pandemic. And I am confident that together we will continue to advance towards a more competitive uh, European banking sector. Uh, a sector that will play a key role in supporting the recovery, a strong uh, recovery. And I also hope that we will have the foresight to adapt to this fast changing world so we may succeed in bringing the age of opportunity to everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carlos. Let me, um, before we maybe move to another topic, let me follow up uh, on uh, your speech in two ways, one for you and one for Andrea. When I was reading it, and now also that I've, uh, I'm listening to you, there are two uh, paragraphs that have kept my attention. One is, you say, and uh, rightly so, we need uh, <clears throat> to, be, to have a new uh, skills in the board, the digital climate, you name it. Then. But on the other hand, we also need to oversee traditional management, uh, traditional management and traditional bank risk. So from your experience, now that we see more diverse boards, we, but with the same number of people, and in some cases, even a declining number of people in, in, um, in uh, boards, what is your experience of this greater diversity in boards? I mean, are, are we still somehow managing the traditional part of the bank in a proper way and adding to that? Or do you see also some challenges in increasing the diversity? Thank you, thank you, Ellen. I think the main challenge is not so much combining the two because that's precisely the, the beauty of having a, a diverse board is that you can have a specialist knowledge on traditional banking areas. I think most banks, most banks, I mean, I, don't, I wouldn't know and, and Andrea would be better placed to comment on, on, on the uh, statistics across, across the, uh, the different institutions. But in my more personal experience, which is, maybe biased, I don't know. Uh, I do believe that uh, most boards I know have the traditional, are rich in the traditional banking know-how, the credit risk, uh, market risk, uh, operational risk, uh, and so on. Some areas, some of those areas have been reinforced uh, quite dramatically in the last 10 years, uh, as I say, as I already mentioned in my opening remarks, uh, through, through many, many, many changes in procedures, policies, etc. But I believe that part is well taken care of and, and by uh, just bringing in specialized knowledge in, in the other areas, in the cyber technology, uh, sustainability, ESG inclusiveness, um, and uh, the impact that disruption will have across economies. Um, I, I don't see that there is a conflict in that you're gonna lose out on the traditionals because as long as you have a sufficiently diverse board, you can, uh, also compose committees that have dedication to risk or compliance or, or audit or, or, or technology, like in our case, that, that, or sustainability or, or strategy or whatever the committee is, that you combine the skill set that is needed for that particular purpose. I believe the bigger challenge is not in, in the operation after, is in bringing those new skills that are in such high demand that are just hard to find. It's really uh, quite, because it, 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 it is widespread. Uh, the world has digitized, that's a clear yes, one. That's Cyber in particular with increased. COVID. And it's very hard to find board, uh, board, board member uh, uh, candidates that can dedicate the time, that have the, 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 right, um, the right skills and, and have the experience also to serve in boards of a large institution. That and then that they will accept the job because of the position, I should say, yeah. because uh, of the high demand. Yeah, no, absolutely. So let me, be, uh, I see that there are already quite a number also of questions in the chat, but maybe let me pose one question to Andrea before we move to the chat question. One other part mentioned by Carlos, it says, it also means boards must allow for innovation, experimentation, something hard normally for a bank and for supervisors, because somehow we all treasure risk avoidance and the trodden path. 
So what I'm, what I guess I'm asking to you is, how do you see this from the side of the supervisor? I mean, you were referring before to the importance of the sustainability of bank business model, in particular in the longer term. So that, and with all the challenges that the Carlos talked about and that we know, banks will have to somehow change some of the traditional business lines you know, that they are used to. And that will call for indeed uh, experimentation and for, I wouldn't say more risk, but thinking a little bit more out of the box, if, if I, I may say it in this way. For example, also digital uh, investment, that may also take longer before actually the, um, you can see the results of such strategies, the new strategies that the bank will entail. So how, what do you think is the role of supervisor in this? Do you think the supervisor can help banks in thinking a little bit more out of the box or what do you think uh, the role can be? Well, I think it's a, it's a misrepresentation of the supervisor as uh, considering that, that uh, we always want everything uh, to, to stay as it is, not to change because change is risk, no? I mean, to some extent, if I can uh, 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 convey, let's say, uh, if I had to, to sketch a picture of what I saw when I joined the, the supervisory board of the ECB here in terms of the banking landscape, my greatest concern was that I saw many banks that were just, uh, you know, complaining about uh, negative interest rates, low interest rate environment, and basically waiting, you know, that uh, a change in the in the monetary policy stance uh, would have created a, a, a widening of the of the net interest margin, regenerating some some room for, for profitability. And we have been pushing actually banks uh, uh, quite a lot also uh, in our uh, analysis of business model to uh, to take uh, self help measures. So to start dealing more radically on. Uh, with the uh, cost efficiency issues uh, to deal more radically with the uh, uh, refocusing of the business model and indeed uh, with uh, investments in digitalization and, uh, and uh, addressing issues that shortcomings that we have identified as supervisors in their, in their IT system. We, we have been actually pushing very much for change in all these areas. So having, uh, uh, boards uh, more aligned with this uh, uh, necessity for change, I think is something that as supervisors uh, we would welcome. This is important to restore profitability for banks and, uh, and profitability is good also from the supervisory point of view. I mean, if a bank is not uh, an attractive investment proposition, is, is, is a bank which has difficulty in raising capital in time of need in the markets and it's something that for us is not, uh, is not, uh, is not good. Of course, let's say, um, there is an issue of balance. I mean, uh, when you innovate, uh, you know, you also need to uh, to choose the timing in the in the in the in the appropriate uh, in the appropriate way. You know, I mean, so you 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 need to be. Uh, there is always, as you say, an amount of risk, and, and this should be judged with uh, uh, with uh, let's say with balance in my view. Uh, and. Uh, uh, sometimes I remember when I when I moved to London, no, I I went to a very nice apartment on the on the docks uh, in on the on the river, and uh, the 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 builder of that uh, of that uh, it was a major uh, let's say initiative launched in the 70s actually, and they said that there was this innovative visionary uh, let's say commercial real estate developer and, and residential real estate developer that uh, the the idea of transforming you know, the, the the river there. Of course, he went bust after 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 four years. Then the area developed, and uh, his ideas are now mainstream. You know? So sometimes, also when you move too fast in a certain area, taking too much risk, it can be also uh, a little bit too much to uh, to swallow. And also, uh, it's always an, a, an issue of moving, uh, and banks do need to move right now. Uh, and to move with judgment and with uh, with uh, prudence, of course, from our point of view, but still still to innovate. Okay, I, I'm always a conscious a little bit of the time that flies too quickly. So let me uh, maybe move to the to the other topic we wanted to cover before going back to some of the questions from the audience, which is the role that the banks may play in the next generation EU. So maybe I start asking this question to Carlos. How do you see this? Um, and then to Andrea, again, from the side of the supervisor, how do you see uh, banks that can really foster a player role in the next generation EU? Please, Carlos, first. Uh, 
Uh, sorry, yeah. Um, I believe that banks can play a very important role in in, uh, in sustaining the recovery and, and using the uh, the funds as uh, and levering upon them. No, I, I think in the past, uh, since the beginning of the pandemic, we have stepped up to help our clients, to help society in general. I mentioned that already. And going forward, we will continue to play a critical role. Uh, and next generation EU is a unique opportunity to support economic recovery. It's a unique opportunity to modernize Europe, to modernize our economy, to modernize society. With this more focus on digital, on sustainability, on inclusiveness, uh, with a more inclusive model, uh, a model that promotes investment, long-term investment, job, job creation. And my, my view of next generation is that the public authorities, rather than directly investing the, the, the large amounts that we're involved talking about, uh, could focus on, on defining the goals, the policy goals, and then setting the incentives uh, and using the funds also to attract uh, private investment. Um, because I think um, we need to maximize the multiplier effect uh, with those right incentives to attract private investment. It is private investment that is, uh, by its very nature, well directed towards activities that produce uh, welfare. So in the long run, we, we do see a strong correlation that the countries that have higher private investment uh, over GDP are the ones that have the higher growth in the GDP per capita. And this is across any cross-section of countries uh, in long time periods, this is the explanatory variable is investment over GDP, private investment. So I see that the focus of the funds has initially been placed on, on infrastructure projects. And OK, that's a role of the public sector, fine. Uh, but I believe that the, the funds should, should really reach uh, in a much wider way, transforming all, especially SMEs, entrepreneurs, individuals. And for that, we need more of a broad spectrum programs and incentives to bring in private investment from those parties and allocating the funding uh, through an agile, competitive, transparent schemes. And here, banks can play a key role. We can take advantage of, of our networks, our capillarity, our relationships, We can because we have the reach for those programs to really uh, be accessible to companies and individuals. Uh, small, medium, the large ones have no, no issue in accessing everywhere in all regions. And, and, and we can also not only reach and provide the access, but provide advice. We can evaluate and analyze projects. Uh, and then we can amplify by, we can underwrite. So the assessment that we do is also with skin in the game. So it makes things straight that the funds are well used. And we can amplify with financing. Uh, and um, Anyway, I could give some examples how we're doing that at BBVA, given that uh, it's still early times because next generation EU programs are being developed. But uh, we're working, for example, on a um, rehabilitation of, of uh, housing, which is a very clear opportunity to finance and, and with an end-to-end -end package solution to channel next generation EU funds to uh, communities uh, that can make this investment. And we can do the energy study. We can uh, channel the funds. We can uh, anticipate them with financing, and then we can get repaid with the savings from the energy bill. So those types of, uh, of, uh, of uh, programs also with uh, auto dealers for the electric cars, etc. Anyway, in, in some big opportunity to modernize. Uh, the main thing in my mind is private investment and banks can be critical in amplifying with private investment. Thank you. What, uh, Andrea, what do you think is the role of supervisor in uh, helping bank fostering the implementation of the next generation EU? Well, maybe, uh, let's say, that's a bit less visionary than, <laughs> than the other things we have talked so far. But for me, uh, the key function also of the banks in the coming uh, months, I would say, is really uh, proper, good credit risk management. Now, because what I see now is that we are now in a phase in which governments have been helping everybody, have been keeping everybody afloat. So if you look at the bankruptcies, there has been a total uh, reduction in bankruptcies because everybody has been supported. And then you will have a big fiscal package that will support robust growth. 
But this package, rightly in my view, will be, let's say, focusing on certain initiatives. In particular, as we know, I mean, green, digital will be a strong focus of the uh, public support uh, the, of the fiscal package. So the recovery will be robust, but probably also uneven. So there will be sectors that probably will not come back uh, from the crisis without casualties. So I think that the key function of the banks now is both to identify, you know, uh, the, 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 the counterparts that can uh, benefit from uh, the initiatives that will accompany next generation EU and then support those uh, companies and, and, and drive uh, growth on a, on a, on a much uh, more robust uh, path but also to look through the current, uh, the current support packages and see which are the counterparts that will not manage, uh, that are unlikely to pay back the loans and start taking early measures uh, for restructuring the loans, for uh, you know, uh, uh, restoring the capability to pay, or eventually if there is no, no hope, also to you know, start uh, the procedures to, uh, and start managing actively uh, the, the non-performing exposure. So I think that these, these two aspects need both to be uh, very present in the minds of banks and banks boards. So the, the traditional credit risk management, looking through also the public support packages and the more visionary long-term growth oriented uh, type of uh, dynamics that will be uh, triggered by the, by the, the fiscal, by the next generation review. Oh, I completely. I just, I don't know if I may. Yeah, please, I, please. No, I completely, I completely agree. So I focus more on that second part. But as I mentioned also in my opening remarks, uh, one of the key areas uh, where I believe all boards should be concentrated is in very close monitoring of the exit from the uh, hibernation, uh, so to speak, that we have been in in many economies by virtue of the um, support programs, and as those are exited. This, this uncertainty as to what's going to happen and how to, uh, in an early way, manage uh, the fallout. Um, we're well provisioned, I believe, um, and all of our models show so, uh, ours and, and in conversations with peers, but the uncertainty is so high that we, we don't know. So uh, not, not, I completely agree with Andrea. But how do you see, Andrea, if I may, um... How do you see banks prepare for this? I mean, we there has been a lot of emphasis now in the last year on uh, how many provisions banks have put aside uh, and a lot of focus on the credit risk. And now you are right that, <laughs> especially in some countries, the public support measure continues. So the difficulty of evaluating you know, the, the loan portfolios in banks uh, is effectively there because we have all these still uh, existing public support measures. But in your view, of course, there will be big variance and variability across countries, but also within countries across banks. But overall, how do you see banks being prepared vis-a-vis -vis that? Well, this, this is a question to which is very difficult to answer, no? because I, I don't see the banks. I see individual banks. And some banks are, are very good at doing it. Some banks are less good at doing it. So that's where we as supervisors are very much keen in differentiating uh, across banks. So we are doing, I'm very proud of the work we are doing, our teams are doing. Uh, they're going very granular on, uh, you know, on uh, uh, loan classification stage, staging according to IFRS 9, provisioning choices, uh, sectoral exposures and the like. And there is a very, very in-depth debate. I think that the area in which probably we're focusing the most right now and where we have identified most findings, so negative findings in our, in our process so far, is in the um, uh, assessment of unlikely to pay and in the forbearance uh, measures. So uh, these are the two areas which are key no, right now. So several banks have switched off the unlikely to pay assessment. So basically they have moratoria, they just don't do the assessment. They don't assess whether the the customer is likely to pay when the when the the, the measures are withdrawn or there are public support measures that is uh, uh, i mean uh, in these cases we try to you know drill down and send negative feedback to the banks and asking them to the, the other thing is forbearance flagging i mean several measures that are taken that are not classified as forbearance and the sort of wait and see attitude also no? basically you 
you start you basically think that the bank that the counterpart is not paying uh, and then you you just wait and see and waiting and seeing in, in my view at this juncture is the most uh, uh, risky uh, type of uh, behavior so the, the most uh, uh, long sighted behavior is starting engaging early with the customers, early management of arrears, and trying to restructure as soon as possible. So, these two areas, I think, are the most important for us. Yeah, I mean, on the other hand, if I have to spend the word in defending somehow banks, it's fair to say for them, this assessment is really not easy sometimes now because they are used to focus on the past somehow to predict the future. And as you say, sometimes the past is no longer indicative of the future now. So this requires that also the assessment of the banks changes in a non-trivial way somehow. You know? They must be able to be much more forward-looking somehow in their assessment, which is not traditionally what they have done in their credit assessment. Yeah. No? That's why I don't like to talk about the banks. I mean, here there are some good practices out there, several, I mean, some many banks have adjusted their, their, their tools, their indicators, their early warning systems uh, to be more forward-looking. And there are good practices out there. Some banks are very effective in doing that. Of course, even in a very uncertain environment, nobody has uh, the, the crystal ball here and nobody's asking banks to have the crystal ball, but uh, many banks have done a lot of progress in terms of, of changing their assessment tools, uh, some others less so. So I know we are really ending this, but maybe just one final word. We have been talking about climate uh, in various uh, moments of, uh, of the talk, but we haven't talked much about ESG more at general, if I may say so. So, uh, Carlos, you mentioned in several occasions the word of, of, uh, ES, I mean, of climate and ESG. If I have to ask you just two sentences, given the time, how do you see bank boards preparing vis-a-vis -vis this? What would be your uh, short uh, response at this stage? Yeah, well, uh, I would highlight how important it is that they prepare because it's going to be, I mentioned it in my intro remarks, uh, the largest disruption that mankind has ever, ever seen in terms of the impact they will have on the economy. Um, because if we're going to decarbonize, and it seems, given the commitments that this will happen, this will have so many effects. And it'll be, I, I, I would, um, so this risk and opportunity, again, as we were discussing earlier, but the opportunity is huge uh, because there will be a lot of investment in innovative technologies that are needed to solve the problem. The problem doesn't have a solution right now. If we're going to get to net zero, we need to crack very hard problems. And those are going to need a lot of investment in innovation. Uh, and then there's going to be a, a big investment in deploying those solutions. And there is uh, estimates of, of trillions. I think OCD's estimate is between five and seven trillion investment per year. Uh, so that's the opportunity side. Of course, the stranded assets that will be also quite large is the... Um, is the risk side. And I think uh, banks are already moving uh, fast to uh, tackle this issue head on by um, um, dedicating um, the entire organization really to this because sustainability and climate change in particular will affect all businesses, uh, retail, SMEs, larger companies, commercial business, uh, corporates, of course, asset management, you name it, across our product suite. Uh, and we need to adapt and we need to uh, understand the, the science, the technology. Uh, we need to prepare our teams to uh, uh, advise clients. The advisory side is going to be critical. So it's investing, is uh, advising, and then it's exiting uh, whenever uh, we see that the risk is going to be there because the client is not transitioning uh, before uh, the impact comes. So we need to scale up our teams and at the board, there will be a reflection of that. Andrea, your final word on this before we conclude, if you want. Well, uh, again, on, on this, uh, the, the, the point is sometimes I perceive a little bit, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, whenever I talk to banks, uh, I, I feel this concern that ESG eventually will be will be translated into higher capital bar, no, and that eventually uh, the, the concern is, you know, there is low profitability now. ESG is coming; there will be higher requirements. So, uh, 
I, I think honestly that uh, uh, it is important that from every side it is understood that first of all, this is not a capital issue. I mean, there might be, of course, if there are excessive risks, it will be reflected in the capital framework as anything else, but it's not something which is raising the bar on, on capital uh, by construction or by, by intention. Um, the, the, and the key point is actually that it is an important key to uh, put profitability on a sound and, and, and long-term footing. So, uh, and sometimes it, there is also the impression that this is something which is, you know, a little bit uh, farther away. So maybe it's already a difficult moment. We have COVID, uh, we have Basel, can't we wait a bit, no? And, and the, the other point for me is actually these, uh, these risks could be, you know, uh, could uh, uh, materialize in a long period of time, but we could have sudden acceleration. So it's important that we start factoring into this, uh, into the, the, the risk management of the, of the banks uh, and the strategic uh, perception of the boards. Also, these elements, uh, the sooner the better. Okay, I know, the, I, I know it's two o'clock. I don't really want to drag on your time anymore. Thank you very much for being with us today. Thank you for the support to the initiative and for the conversation. And I hope that there will be other ways to, 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 to meet you again. I mean, also Carlos in particular, given that he's the newcomer to the Florida School of Banking and Finance. And thank you to all attendants for having been with us. Thank you and have a nice day. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very you. much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.